Hey everyone, I'm Nick Henderson, podcaster over at 4playernetwork.com. What an amazing year. These are my top 10 games of 2015. Okay, coming in at number 10 is a game that I wrestled with for months before caving and adding it to my top 10 list. It's honestly one of the hardest decisions I had to make because it's just been that kind of year. Trying to decide which games didn't quite make the cut was so much more difficult than deciding which games would rank higher in my list. But few games evoked as much uncontrollable rage and supreme satisfaction as Titan Souls. Acid Nerve lifted this boss-focused concept from Shadow of the Colossus and combined it beautifully with the colorful palette of a 2D Zelda game. And that's not why it made my list though. Gaming is all about player feedback, and Titan Souls excels at that feedback. I would say that feedback is so visceral and so insanely satisfying that I had a really hard time maintaining my inside voice once I finished a fight. These boss fights are brutally difficult, and they aren't sorry. Not at all. They just don't give a shit. I don't play games for the challenge. Like, ever. I rarely play on harder difficulties, and I'm not even interested in bragging rights. But something about Titan Souls kept me going all the way to the end. I finished all 19 bosses, even the optional boss at the end. And some of those bosses took 50 plus tries. That's crazy when you consider each boss only requires a single, well-placed attack to overcome. There are so many memorable and brilliantly designed bosses, and each one requires a unique strategy to defeat. These strategies aren't telegraphed either, or really explained in any way, so it does require an acute attention to detail, and even some creativity on the part of the player to come out victorious. Unfortunately, the world that you explore, quote unquote, is pretty much an empty void. Nothing more than a colorful backdrop as you move from one boss to the next. Puzzles or dungeons or something would have gone a long way in making this game feel less like a one-trick pony. Luckily, that one trick is pretty damn cool. So, I would say try it out if you appreciate a good challenge. I can't exactly promise the deepest of experiences, but I can assure you that little is as satisfying as landing a well-placed arrow to the heart in Titan Souls. Okay, I'll be honest, I've barely scratched the surface of Fallout 4. In fact, I've only sunk about 12 hours into it collectively, but I look forward to spending way more time with the game now that 2015 is finally over. What I can say for sure is that I have a soft spot for the series. I have ever since Fallout 3 released. I'm not sure if it's the music, or the art direction, or the character progression, but I certainly wasn't going to let something like my limited amount of time with the game keep it from my list. Fallout is a game that needs no introductions, or explanations. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know why Fallout 4 is so great. It's a game so massive and so addicting that it's easy to forgive its many technical issues. What it lacks in technical polish though, it makes up for in depth, density, variety. I wasn't immediately sold on the Boston setting, but even in the short amount of time that I've spent with the game, it completely changed my tune. Boston is every bit as beautiful and fun to explore as the Capital Wasteland or New Vegas. You can't walk 10 feet without stumbling across some new location, whether it's a, a high school or a stadium or, you know, a, I don't know, a hole in the ground that just leads you to the massive cave. Who the fuck knows? But every new location means new characters, new possible companions, new stories, new enemies, new weapons, and of course, new distractions. Talk about a game that makes it hard to focus. Jesus Christ. What I wasn't expecting, though, was to find out how much more aggressive enemies in this game have become. Ghouls. Ghouls, who used to be, like, a joke, are terrifying in this game. They're fast, they're aggressive, and they'll kill you really quick. Of course, the beloved VAT system makes a welcome return, but time no longer stops completely when you activate it. Instead, it kind of slows to a crawl. It's a simple change with dramatic effects on the pacing of combat. More so than previous games, I feel like the combat has a sense of urgency now, and I think that it's a better game for it. Honestly, there's a good chance that Fallout 4 could have ranked higher on my list had I had more time to explore fully. But, even with my limited time with the game, I can say there are a few features and design choices that I'm not entirely thrilled about. For instance, the base building feature is cool in theory, I guess, but I find its implementation to be sloppy and confusing, and I don't really anticipate spending a lot of time with it. 
I also felt that the choice to open the game before the bombs dropped had so much storytelling potential, but it ultimately felt like a huge wasted potential. And of course, I hate to rank the game based on my early game impressions. I feel like I kind of cheated putting it on this list. But let's not split hairs here, people. I don't need to play 100 hours to know that I love Fallout. Some might claim that putting Mad Max in this list is pandering to my love of Mad Max Fury Road. And you know what? They might be partially right. That was an awesome fucking movie. But I've had my eye on Mad Max for several years now, and while it may not win any awards for originality, it does manage to do a lot of different things surprisingly well. The world, despite being a barren wasteland, does manage to deliver a wealth of things to see, collect, and of course, kill. And it does so against a pretty unusual backdrop. And no, I'm not saying that post-apocalyptic games are rare, but few are as beautiful as Mad Max. And despite being largely empty, an intentional decision, I assure you, there is an impressive amount to see and do. Also, Avalanche has created another beautifully constructed clone of the Batman Arkham combat. Again, not super original, but you can't deny the appeal of the combat system that was born from that game. Combat is so visceral, thanks to the ease in which you can be overwhelmed. I loved how I frequently felt like I was taking as much of a beating as I was handing out. It's a pretty awesome feeling to barely make it out of a fight in this game, which I feel like is kind of a weird thing to say about a video game. Combat is great, but not the reason I honored it on this list. It also wasn't the insanely dangerous weather systems that threatened to strike at the most inopportune moments. Few things are as epic as trying to drive your way through a freak sand or lightning storm while you are desperately trying to escape a band of pursuers. There were wild, dynamic moments that rivaled some of the wildest action in Fury Road. Think about that for a second. And with all that said, all of these things were great recreations and in some cases, amplifications of systems or mechanics that were introduced in other games. But for me, the real star of the show here was the car combat, and all of the stuff that came with it. No game has ever made me love car combat as much as Mad Max. I've had fun with Twisted Metal in the past, and I was a huge fan of Vigilante 8 back in the day, but I've never been fond of doing anything in an arena. Mad Max gives you a car, a busted ass hunk of junk, and then releases you into this world to just explore and find whatever you can to make that thing a fearsome machine. It really feels like an open world Twisted Metal, and the drive to scour the world in search of scrap that I could use to improve my car was the perfect hook. The combat itself is so much fun, and at times, wildly intense. Nothing this year can really top the feeling of successfully yanking the wheel right off of a quickly approaching enemy vehicle, or landing a direct hit with an explosive spear at full speed. A lot can be said about Mad Max, and it may not offer anything distinctly original, but Avalanche has delivered a game that I will forever look back on as one of the few licensed games to do right by its source material. It takes so many different elements from other games, but strings them together into a beautiful chrome engine and fires on all cylinders. And no, I'm not going to apologize for that terrible pun. Every detail in Batman Arkham Knight is just dripping with reverence for its source material, and I'd argue that very few portrayals in film or television have managed to capture the magic quite as effectively. Rocksteady has, across multiple games, managed to incorporate so many classic Batman characters, references, and plots into a single portrayal of the universe that it's a miracle the game didn't fall apart at the seams a long time ago. In Arkham Knight, Rocksteady not only delivered what I consider to be one of the best conclusions imaginable, but also the best Arkham game in the series to date, no question. As the series has progressed, the portrayal of Gotham City has grown and grown, from the confines of Arkham Asylum up to the fully realized streets of Gotham City. And holy shit, the world in Arkham Knight is mind-blowing. It's densely packed with secrets, villains, and references. It's a Batman fan's wet dream. And the team didn't shy away from even the most obscure references either, and instead jumped at the opportunity to introduce lesser-known characters to a more mainstream audience. This is one of the few games out there that takes full advantage of what it means to tell a story in an open world. You never quite know what to expect or when to expect it, but there are so many moments that took my breath away that just unfolded naturally within the world. I won't waste any time praising the flawless Arkham combat system. What would be the point? They wrote the book on it, and it's still amazing. What I will gush over, however, is the implementation of the Batmobile. The Batmobile here is fully realized and immediately accessible at any time during open world exploration, in much the same way that you would call your horse in Zelda or The Witcher. It's a vehicle that empowers the player, but demands respect and mastery to use effectively. At the beginning, I felt completely overwhelmed by the speed and maneuverability of the car, but as the game progressed, so did my ability. By the end, I felt like a master. 
To make it even better, Rocksteady packed the car full of gadgets and abilities to use during combat, and even puzzle solving. Its ability to turn into a tank on the fly was certainly divisive, but I absolutely loved it because of its simplicity. Perhaps the tank battles were a bit overused towards the end of the game, but I still consider it a welcome feature. All of it came together to make one of the most versatile and satisfying vehicles that I've ever used in a game before. Lastly, the choice to spin a classic Batman arc into a conclusion here was certainly a divisive one as well. Some of the plot points and twists were telegraphed maybe a little too well, but the story itself was a good one. The acting is superb, and several classic villains make a welcome return, and easily steal the show. And you know, it shouldn't surprise anyone to know that Mark Hamill's Joker plays a role in this game, but that role was easily one of the best kept secrets of the year. Mark Hamill knocks it out of the park in the most incredible way, but that's all I'm going to say about it. It's a fantastic game, a fantastic conclusion to a beloved series, and easily one of my most memorable experiences of 2015. I'm kidding. Looks like I got my story. This is it, Batman. This could get me back. Clay Entertainment made Mark of the Ninja. Remember how awesome that game was? It was a 2D stealth action game that could easily go toe to toe with some of the best games in the entire stealth genre. A few years later, and it feels like they've taken it even further by melding the stealth action genre with that of turn based strategy in Invisible Ink. It all comes together using a really well realized universe with a heavy emphasis on corporate espionage and computer hacking. Invisible Ink is a game that is densely packed with rules, mechanics, and visual feedback. So much so that I can imagine a lot of people may have passed on the experience for fear of mechanical overload. If Mark of the Ninja taught me anything though, it's that Clay has made the art of visual explanation their bitch. Their knack for streamlining complex mechanics into sleek, beautiful presentations is so impressive. Everything from how you move your agents along the grid to how they communicate space and your position to guards is downright beautiful. Between missions, your overall success often depends on simple choices like, do I travel 12 hours to complete a mission in Europe and acquire a really important resource, or do I travel 6 hours to Chicago for a lesser reward? When the clock on the entire game starts with just 72 hours, it's pretty scary to imagine sacrificing 12 of those just traveling, but the rewards can range from a boost in funds to new potential targets to enhancements for your AI partner Incognita. It's a careful balancing act, but one that is a lot of fun once you understand the flow. I also love the light RPG elements that allow you to customize the growth of your agents. Depending on how you upgrade each agent, you may be able to move farther on each turn, knock out guards more frequently thanks to faster cooldowns, hack tougher security panels, you name it. The same mechanics also extend to Incognita herself, since you can use her to disable security cameras and trip lasers, manipulate security robots, and ultimately open up new paths and optional spoils. Of course, adapting to bad situations is the name of the game here, since security measures gradually increase the longer you take to complete your mission. The missions that involved me desperately dragging my unconscious partner to the exit while eluding waves of alerted security were among the most exhilarating moments of the year for me. Even though the game can look intimidating to an outsider, it is one that I promise will surprise you. It's not nearly as overwhelming as it looks, and the rewards for taking the plunge are well worth the investment. And we're finally moving into top 5 territory here. If the award for the most predictable success of 2015 goes to Fallout or The Witcher, the award for biggest fucking surprise success of the year certainly goes to Until Dawn, an interactive slasher film from Supermassive Games, a developer who doesn't exactly have the best track record yet. Drawing influence from games like Heavy Rain and the flagship Telltale series of The Walking Dead, Until Dawn tells a story full of twists and turns that is pumped full of player choice and consequences. Surprisingly, it starts strong and maintains this momentum all the way to the end, and delivers a pretty damn satisfying conclusion. I'd even consider it one of the best slasher horror films in years, as most of its revelations land and the characters are memorable and well acted. They may not all be likable, but how often are they in a horror movie? Its gameplay can be boiled down to pretty simple segments of environment exploration, dialogue choices, and decision making that can affect relationships, or even land you in some real precarious situations, like shit up to your eyeballs kinds of situations. On the surface, it may appear to be another game writing the coattails of another game's success, but there is actually a lot of originality here, and what I found is that the game handles these elements better than many of its predecessors. The game does do some pretty unexpected things as well. For instance, there are hidden totems scattered throughout the world that give you a brief glimpse of the future when you touch them. I'm talking like 2-3 to three seconds of disorienting visions with absolutely no context. It's a pretty awesome feeling down the road when these visions start to make sense, and the impact they can have on your story can actually be pretty significant. Even then, survival really depends on your reflexes and ability to not dwell on making tough decisions. Your journal keeps track of all the mysteries and outlines the impact of your choices, which also creates a nice layer of Scooby-Doo-esque mystery to the game. 
Also, bravo to the writers for remaining committed to the concept from start to finish. The characters are well acted, pitiful excuses for human beings, and they demonstrate bad judgment all the time. Jump scares are frequent and often completely non-threatening, which on more than one occasion made me scream like a little bitch. However, this is very much the point, as Until Dawn is an unapologetic love letter to classic slasher movies. With that said, the predictability actually ends there, as much of the game's plot is full of welcome twists that coalesce in a pretty satisfying way at the end. Fans of corny slasher films will revel in the style of Until Dawn, while others will tragically miss the point entirely. It's a game that doesn't shy away from its influences, and for good reason. It may not be as deep or as long as other games in this list, but it evoked a feeling that I haven't really felt while playing a game before, and I'm eager to see what kind of legacy it leaves in the genre. The one thing I know is that it was an impressive first effort, and it just barely nudged its way onto my top 5 games of 2015. Where do I even begin with The Witcher 3? It's another game that I'm still working my way through, but given its massive scope and the sheer amount of content, that shouldn't really surprise anyone. The Witcher 3 ended up on this list though for a very simple and obvious reason. This game redefined what it meant to be an open world RPG in 2015. The game's world was massive, beautiful, and most importantly, fluid in its ability to tell a story. I can't think of another game that is as open and seamless but able to communicate such an epic, cinematic, and rich story. The previous two games in the series did manage to introduce the masses to the rich lore of the Witcher universe, but stopped just short of offering an experience that is as deep or rewarding as The Witcher 3. It's a world that feels lived in from top to bottom, making it an absolute joy to explore. There are so many hidden characters and quests to discover that all have their own potential to spiral into a satisfying side story of their own. It feels like these optional quests are usually, if not always, crafted with just as much care from the team as the main plot, which makes The Witcher 3 feel like one of the most evenly crafted RPGs I've ever played. The fast-paced combat and science system from The Witcher 2 makes a welcome return with some obvious improvements, but unfortunately, a satisfying experience system didn't quite make the cut. By far, the most frustrating thing about this game was the inability to grind and gain significant character growth through combat. The only significant source of experience is completing quests. It's a bummer for a game that flies so close to the sun. With that said, the greatest thing about this game is its actual emphasis on being a witcher, a hunter of monsters. Whether you stumble across a nest of wyverns on a cliffside while exploring a mountaintop, or you're given a job by a villager to investigate and eliminate a troubling beast, this is the first time I've felt like a skilled hunter, or truly understood what it actually meant to be a witcher in this world. I love how observing certain monsters will automatically update your bestiary, which you can then reference for vital clues or tactics to use in combat. It's such an amazing way to flesh out the lore, and another way that makes The Witcher feel really authentic. Of course, the main plot is also full of so many wonderfully realized characters. We finally get our first real look at Ciri and Yennefer, and what their relationship with Geralt actually means, something we've only heard about in passing in previous games. It's the first time the motivations of Geralt have felt perfectly clear, and the overarching story benefits from that clarity greatly. The Witcher 3 is an incredible game. I'll never forget my epic battle with a cockatrice against the backdrop of the setting sun, or my quest to rid the Bloody Baron of a truly unfortunate haunting, or any number of other equally amazing quests that litter the world of The Witcher 3. It's a game that absolutely must be played by any fan of the genre. It took three tries to achieve true greatness for the series, but it was well worth the wait, and it should have you quivering in anticipation of their next project, Cyberpunk 2077. Alright, moving into my top three games of the year. Coming in at number 3 is a delightful little 2D metroidvania by the name of Ori and the Blind Forest. Few games this year were as breathtakingly beautiful and brutally challenging as Ori. Right from the start, the game hits you with a touching introduction and then ruthlessly yanks on your heartstrings, setting up the player motivation nicely and making it easily one of the most emotionally touching games of the year. From that moment on, Ori and the Blind Forest is a super demanding but deeply satisfying metroidvania. The sense of progression from start to finish is gradual, but brilliantly paced, and gave me flashbacks to something like Shadow Complex or Guacamelee. What I loved the most was how committed the game remained to all of its skills and abilities. The game is careful to not let you forget any one ability, as you are constantly using and combining skills. Even skills unlocked very early in the game remain useful in late game challenges. One of my favorite abilities allows you to basically propel yourself in any direction you want by catapulting off of projectiles and even airborne enemies. It's awesome how they managed to make it integral to both platforming and puzzle solving, and it's easily a highlight of the experience. But the true beauty of Ori and the Blind Forest lies in the mastery of its level design. The game's world becomes increasingly complex and is constantly up in the ante as Ori becomes more and more powerful. The game's hub location leads to many different areas that one might compare to dungeons from Zelda. And like any good Zelda game, each one has their own twist on the, on the gameplay. 
and some of these twists are too good to spoil. All I'll say is that each one tops the one that came before it, and many of these dungeons conclude with an exhilarating and insanely challenging escape sequence. The kind of escape sequence that involves super demanding platforming, timing, and patience. I love these sequences, despite the fact that they often left me a broken mess. When you get right down to it though, Ori and the Blind Forest is another game born from the recent resurgence in the popularity of Metroidvanias. It's easily one of the best that I've ever played, and my dedication to pushing through this challenging game should be a testament to his brilliance. It's drop dead gorgeous, relentlessly challenging, and meticulously crafted, landing it near the top of my list in 2015. Quite honestly, I really disliked Dead Island. It was a mess of a game that lacked polish and vision, and was catapulted to success thanks to a beautifully misleading trailer. So how is it that a game with an incredibly similar concept from the same developer has ended up my second favorite game of 2015? To be quite honest, Dying Light delivers everything that I wanted from Dead Island, and more, and to a shocking degree. I might go as far as to say that this is my favorite zombie game ever made that isn't related to Resident Evil. I loved the game's cheeky blend of espionage storytelling and zombie horror. It makes for a really unique contrast to the hellish island that you're on, and provides just the right motivation to complement the gameplay. Long story short, I loved it. I also can't stress enough how much I love the open world. The tropical setting is beautiful and super fun to traverse using the new parkour system that has basically been lifted and adapted from Mirror's Edge. Running along rooftops using your free running skills to escape the infected is so much bloody fun especially when you effectively combine it with the weapon crafting system that has been lifted and improved from Dead Island. Creating an electrified machete or weaponized buzzsaw never gets old, and the improved effectiveness of actual guns over Dead Island makes the combat that much more addicting. Of course, my personal favorite weapon of choice was my wicked dropkick that I used to catapult unsuspecting zombies off of cliffs and rooftops. The skill trees and RPG elements of Dying Light ultimately end up making the game an absolute joy to explore. But what makes the game really special is how the world changes when night falls. As the sun sets, it's made abundantly clear that you should return to safe zones and take shelter because the proverbial shit is about to hit the fan. At night, the infected become faster, more aggressive, and even gain the ability to climb walls. A new terrifying enemy known as the Night Hunter also comes out as well, making stealth incredibly important if you get stuck outside at night, or god forbid, choose to brave the streets intentionally for the boosted experience points that doing so provides. Being chased through the world at night while trying to make it back to the safe zones is by far one of the most terrifying but amazing experiences I've ever had in a zombie game. Dying Light allows for complete and total freedom to explore and make your experience as fun or as terrifying as you see fit. It's one of the most exciting games I've played all year, and I'm already chomping at the bit to play more when the expansion hits in early 2016. Whatever you do, don't let your opinion of Dead Island keep you from Dying Light, because they are worlds apart in terms of quality. Here I am, a Souls newbie for all intents and purposes, but I can't deny that Bloodborne was my indisputable game of the year for 2015. From Software's new IP hit the ground running and set itself apart from the famed Souls franchise while simultaneously capitalizing on what makes that series so special to so many people. I was immediately drawn to the dreamlike qualities of its gothic architecture and haunting landscape, and as one might expect, I was totally hooked by the interwoven nature of its quote-unquote open world. It really is unlike anything that I've ever played, because the way the world is pieced together and slowly revealed to the player is perfect. Perhaps it'd be fair to say that this game, and the series that preceded it, rewards curiosity and perseverance in the best way possible. There's nothing quite as blissful as exploring a dangerous path, risking death, and eventually unlocking a new shortcut that connects two areas, or stumbling across a new weapon, piece of equipment, or even a mysterious item whose purpose completely eludes you. It's a world full of mystery, and I've never had quite as much fun exploring and unlocking secrets in a game before. If you listen to our podcast, you know that I am a huge fan of storytelling, which is why I love how the world of Bloodborne is dripping with lore, abstract meaning, haunting characters, and somehow it manages to present it all without throwing it in your face. It doesn't subscribe to the idea that a story or circumstance has to really make sense to be good. What I truly love about the world is that the meaning behind so many things is often left to your imagination or interpretation. Answers are definitely out there to be found, but the answers you find are not always blatant or obvious. What is obvious though is that the world is beautifully realized and incredibly unforgiving. Rapid Dark Souls fans would probably argue that Bloodborne stands as the most approachable game in the Souls series, and they might be right. I'm not sure if it's the increased mobility of the character, the use of ranged weaponry, or what, that's a question for a soul savant, of which I'm definitely not, but it certainly does provide its fair share of brutal difficulty. 
learning to dodge, riposte, read enemy movements, it's all still paramount to success. And delivering the killing blow to a boss character is still one of the most euphoric feelings I've ever felt in a video game. As I mentioned at the beginning of this list, I don't often subject myself to overly difficult games, because most of the time, I don't really feel it's justified. Not only does Bloodborne represent my introduction to the Soul series though, but I think it effectively justified its difficulty by having an incredibly balanced combat system, a wonderfully rewarding world to explore, and let's not forget that the creatures themselves are insanely beautiful, disturbing, and sometimes haunting. But beautiful nonetheless. I was constantly pushing forward because I could not wait to see what lied ahead, and a lot of the time, all that stood between me and the unknown was an incredibly aggressive beast that wanted nothing more than to rip me to shreds. Some of these fights took a long time to complete, but I did complete them. It's a game that I absolutely expected to get the best of me, but was pleasantly surprised to find myself shrugging off the frustration and charging forward with a smile on my face every single time. There are so many memorable moments and locations that I'll never forget. The first time that I entered the Forbidden Woods, or Kanehurst Castle, among others, will be forever burned into my memory. But perhaps more than anything, Bloodborne converted me to a dedicated Souls fan. I'm eager to see what comes to the future of the franchise, as I'm sure it will definitely be a franchise. And it ensured that 2016, for me, will be the year of Dark Souls, as I'm currently playing through the original and plan to plow through 2 and 3 in the year ahead. Like many others, the creativity and ingenuity of From Software in Bloodborne captured my imagination and the imagination of the community in a way that is truly special. All I know is that I can't wait for the next game from these guys so we can hunker down around the water cooler, or in my case, the microphones, to talk about this feeling again, because it truly comes around once in a blood red moon. And there you have it guys, those are my top 10 games of 2015. It's been an absolutely incredible year for gaming, a great year for the website, we're very excited to see what the future holds. And believe it or not, 2016 looks like it's going to be even crazier. I know that's kind of crazy to think about, but uh, it should be fun. We hope you guys will stick with us here at 4PlayerNetwork.com.